It's early days at the moment. As you might know, we have first started doing the DCD transplants only last year, the first one being in July, just over a year ago now. And since then, we have carried out six who are all well at home with very good heart function. And thankfully, others have followed suit. And so in England, there's a unit at Cambridge where I used to work before where they've done another six. And then there's a unit in London, Harefield Hospital, where they've done two. And all the patients so far are doing well. So we know that the short-term results are no different from those from brain-dead donors. But only time will tell what will happen in the medium to long term. It depends very much on the location of the donor and the recipient. If they happen to be co-located, as when the original heart transplants used to be done and with using DCD donors, then of course the costs and infrastructure requirements are not so great because you can do it in the same hospital, almost in adjacent theatres, and you could use technology such as ECMO, which is a way of putting patients on bypass and cooling the body rapidly to preserve the organs. But sadly, these are very rare occurrences, and most of the time, the donor and recipients are actually in disparate locations, which requires you not only to preserve the heart, but have means of transporting it, and therefore also to have means of assessing it. And that's where the problem lies, because the only technology we have at the moment that is currently commercially available is one which can bring the heart back in a beating fashion physiologically, and it is quite expensive. And I mean, you can offset the costs in terms of you know, economics and less time perhaps in ICU and so on, but the outlay initially is actually quite significant. Okay, so DCD transplant is, is, is one where the donor has got extensive neurological injury or a high spinal cord problem and in whom there is no way of um, ever regaining any sort of quality of life. And therefore, because you have not been able to declare them brain dead, as in terms of the internationally recognized brainstem death criteria, then the only thing you can do in consultation with the family is to have a period of withdrawal of support. That typically means withdrawing them from the ventilator. And of course, if you do not have the basic reflex to even breathe, then the chances are then you will die. Of course, that time varies. So withdrawal of support in the form of a ventilator and if, because there's no oxygen, then the heart will stop, and it is a cessation of a heartbeat that allows you to declare the patient dead, just as if somebody dies at home and the doctor comes and says, this patient is declared dead because they have no heartbeat, no breath sounds, and are unarousable. It is exactly the same scenario. And then, of course, there's a period of two to five minutes, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, whereby you cannot do anything to the patient just to avoid the pot potential the remote chance of auto-resuscitation of the heart, because we know that that does not happen after two minutes. And, and then there's an absolute rush to try and get these patients who are now donors following the declaration of death to the appropriate theater for retrieval of the organs. So the, DC, the, the best pathway always is one of a brain-dead donation, because that guarantees a very controlled situation whereby you can maximize the number of organs you can safely retrieve and translate that into a higher number of transplants you can achieve. In the DCD setting, which invariably and mandatorily has a time period called the warm ischemic time, when there's no blood flowing anywhere, and essentially the, the organs are engorged with still circulation, then acidosis builds up and therefore certain organs, particularly the heart and the liver, are not resilient to this period of ischemia, lack of oxygen and blood flow. And therefore, if you do not have the right time, if you cannot get there early enough after heart stops, then of course you may not be able to use the heart and the liver. There's much more time available for the kidneys and the lungs, which are more resilient as organs, and that's why we would allow up to 90 minutes or maybe even longer at times. But for the heart and the liver, it's 30 minutes. The Australian system has uh, two important um, issues. One is that of a named uh, donor specialist, and that usually is a specialist intensivist who takes on this responsibility and who is identifying potential donors in the hospital, and he is closely um, he or she is very closely uh, flanked by a donor coordinator who helps to then liaise with the family. And it is 
this person in the intensive care unit and the coordinators who are trained to discuss issues of the end of life care in the context of organ donation um, at an appropriate time. And that means that because they're specifically trained and there is a specific responsibility, we, you get a higher percentage of consent done that way than if anybody just uh, who's not trained approaches the family. Okay, the, the lungs are a, quite a resilient organ in that if you preserve them in the brain dead setting or even in the DCD setting with the appropriate solution called a pneumoplegia, then of course you have quite a few hours, even up to six or eight hours uh, before you need to have blood flowing through them again. However, now there's in better technology available in which we try and resuscitate even those marginal lungs that aren't working so well. And the preservation of those, therefore, requires what we call ex vivo platforms, these devices that allow the lungs to be uh, inserted in a, in a circuit, in a ventilated circuit, so that the lungs are working outside of the body and we can then improve their function perhaps by toileting the airway and making sure that the, all the lobes are expanding appropriately, getting rid of extra water that may have accumulated in the lungs and, and deteriorated the function after brainstem death. Um, and so these machines are becoming increasingly more expensive, but they do allow resuscitation of marginal lungs for appropriate translation to transplantation for the benefit of our patients and I think eventually will allow the lungs to also receive therapy that might lessen the degree of post-operative uh, morbidity in these lungs and might even lessen uh, aspects of chronic rejection in the medium term. Organ transplantation as we know it now is pretty crude, have to take organs out of other people's bodies and you know in the heart we have got artificial pumps we use but even those are quite crude at the moment. In the future I see Obviously, organ donation in the context we have now, but also more uh, addition of regenerative therapy, of improved artificial aids, um, and there I think will be combination all of these that will allow us to rely less and less um, of the sort of organs that we're uh, getting from donors at the moment.